this week on the Back Table Podcast. But he pointed out to me very bluntly, he said, Sonny, if you want to change the way BPH is treated, and not just PAE for IRs, you need to work with urologists, and you need to get them to believe in this procedure. And he's like, you're really not going to move the needle. And it made me take a step back. And when I thought about it, I thought, you know, how do I, you know, one person go and, and pitch this idea of, I want to collaborate with urologists and bring PAE to them such that they can see a benefit. We can see a benefit from an interventional radiology community, but ultimately the disease process and the patient can see the benefit. And I think that was really the inspiration is really having a, a, a I'd say a mentor, a colleague, friend who's who's in your, if you will, competing specialty, give you an honest opinion about, hey, you got to build something collaborative. And from that, we decided that we got to build these prostate centers. And so we started with a pilot and nothing like nothing like a first clinical trial and nothing like a pilot prostate. <laughs> That's where we went. Hey, everyone, and welcome to the Back Table Innovation Podcast. You can find all previous episodes of our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and on backtable.com. This is our next installment in the Back Table Innovation Show, where you will hear stories from physician entrepreneurs and innovators who are helping to drive healthcare forward through medtech innovation. Hey, everybody, really exciting news. Our listeners asked, and we have answered. We now have CME available. You can get AMA Category 1 CME for listening to Backtable and then filling out a reflection. You can find the CME links on episode pages at backtable.com, or you can also find the CME links in the show notes. It's a small cost for the credit, much less than you would spend at a conference, and it helps support the show. Powered by CMEFI, using AI technology to bring the right education to the right place at the right time. You can do this in just a few minutes. If you're already listening to Backtable, might as well get a CME credit for it. Again. Guys, this helps support the show and allows us to keep bringing you great content. Now, on with the episode. This is Aaron Fritz as your host this week, and I'm excited to introduce our guest, Dr. Sonny Bagla, um, no stranger to the show. Sonny, welcome back to the show. Thanks, Aaron. Good to be here. Got my back table sweatshirt on for the show. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate <laughs> that. You know, our longtime listeners are definitely familiar with, uh, with your voice and your name. You've been on the show a number of times for a variety of different topics, whether I think way back when, you know, first time was with RA and we talked about prostate RA embolization and there was an episode on geniculate artery embolization. You've been on the show for discussions on, on spine ablation and, and, and most recently with Klaus Roburn on prostate artery embolization, collaborating with our ur urology colleagues, which kind of leads into our topic today, which is basically all about, you know, what inspired you to leave a uh, seemingly comfortable private practice job where you had to do, you know, uh, a variety of different procedures. You you had the the nice outpatient inpatient mix, and you wanted to, you know, kind of you saw a lot of promise in in prostate uh, treatments and 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 took this venture on. And so we're going to dive into that. I just want you to quick uh, give our uninitiated audience a quick intro about who you are, where you've been, you know, and kind of, uh, and then we'll get into where you are today. Sure. So I've been in practice now for going on 13 years. Um, actually going on, going on 14 years. And I spent about eight years in a typical uh, interventional diagnostic radiology mixed practice. And then spent four years in an outpatient lab uh, working alongside surgeons, interventional nephrologists, and then building out a couple labs while I was there uh, with my colleagues. And then moved most recently into this prostate centers venture uh, a couple of years ago now. Great, thank you. Um, and so before we dive into the um, you know prostate centers and and kind of why you started that, can you tell us you know you were in private practice, you had an OBL, you know you gave you've given a number of talks that people have heard about OBLs and kind of how to build them successfully. Was there something about the old job that? just wasn't scratching that itch that you wanted to go out and do, you know, you know, do this prostate centers, uh, USA, or was it a perfectly great job? And, you know, it, it was, it's just, you were ready to move on. Yeah. I think, you know, with, with all big decisions in life, there's always probably something good, uh, that you reach for. 
uh, and something that you're missing or bad that makes you want to change your mind. Truthfully, you know, working in an OBL environment, especially an independent OBL, uh, meaning where you're not tied to a existing practice, like a larger radiology interventional practice or to a hospital. Uh, one of the challenges is it can be kind of like Groundhog's Day. So every day you wake up and you go in and, you know, you want to, you know, shake the trees, build relationships, uh, drive new business, raise awareness to what you're doing. And of course, uh, the backbone of all that is providing good care. And I think we were very successful. And I'll say I, I felt like I was very successful in that job, you know, building it to a point where we recruited, you know, two additional interventional radiologists, ran numerous clinical trials. I mean, it really, I would say, met the needs of my, you know, personal career from a diversity standpoint. But, you know, one of the areas it lacked, you know, in, in, in my opinion, was really focus. And, you know, sometimes the focus when you work for other people may not be similar to yours. And uh, we can all appreciate that. And oftentimes, I think, you know, early in your career, it's challenging because you're, you think you probably have the best focus and you think you have the best ideas and you're driven to say, okay, I just think this is the way we should do X, Y, or Z. Whether it's, you know, simple things like, okay, we should only do RF for veins and no more laser, you know, simple things like that. Or if it's, we should target X pop patient population because that's our strong suit. But as you get, yeah, I'd say more mature into your career and at the stage I was in, you know, 10 years into my career, it became more of, you know, what are we focusing our centers on in terms of the type of quality, in terms of revenue and how that's shared, in terms of, I'd say, you know, work-life balance for all the physicians that are working there and the staff. And because of many of those uh, discrepancies I had with respect to where that fit in for me, I think that became sort of, you know, a little bit of a motivation to say, hey, now may be the time to search for what you know, you want to do and put your own stamp on something. And I think that that feeling of wanting to put your own stamp or your own uh, name to a brand, if you will, it, it was definitely a big leap. And that's where sort of that reach for, I would say, reach for good or something new or some change in your career. Um, that's really, you know, I'd say the hard, the hard part. You know, anyone can work in a job and feel like, okay, this could be better. I don't like this. I don't like that. I don't, you know, I'm not getting paid enough, et cetera. Those are all I would say to me, they may be sort of run of the mill complaints that every physician would have or any staff member, really the desire and need to put it into say a formulated process um, and codify that and then stick to that plan and execute something. I think I was ready to do that at this stage of my career. Yeah, that's, that's uh, really helpful. Thank you. For sharing that. And, and so you started private practice research on PAE several years ago in pretty much in its infancy. And you were one of the first clinicians pushing the procedure forward, helping fine tune the technique for better results. Very few people were doing this back then. And, you know, since then, you, you've been, you definitely made a name for yourself uh, in medicine by pushing therapeutic embolization forward in multiple disease processes, you know, prostate being, you know, one of them, uh, but also, like we mentioned, geniculate, frozen shoulder. Um, but tell us, like, what was your main inspiration for prostate in particular and even embolization procedures in particular versus, for example, PAD? Yeah, I think, you know, although I, I really enjoy PAD, and actually it's one of my probably favorite cases and uh, that I look forward to, to doing, and I've been fortunate to have a very busy PAD practice, I still have always found an inherent I would say, um, you know, bias and likening towards embolization cases. There's something about the challenge of looking for which arteries might be contributing to, uh, whether it's a tumor in, you know, in the sense of prostate, whether it's the gland, and which arteries may be contributing to the problem, and then how to basically close those arteries down. There's something I would say more simplistic in my mind when we treat PAD cases with respect to the true aspect of, you know, we always call ourselves in interventional radiology, you know, plumbers, you know, hey, I can open this, improve flow, and, and that's great. And there are some subtleties, as we all know, with PAD that can go on and on, you know, with respect to sizing, stents, drug elution, et cetera. But in embolization, at least when I first started getting involved with respect to PAE, and this is now more than 10 years ago, there was very little known about and very little, I would say, discussed with respect to 
the subtleties of, you know, what size embolic to use, how distal to get with your catheter, um, you know, anatomical configurations that might vary. Because in some of the organs we'd performing embolization on previously, up until that point, there was a lot more, I would say, leeway with respect to the way we'd, we'd perform embolization. So I really saw PAE as probably a, 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 the most significant challenge and something that I think I would never get bored doing because even to this day, Aaron, it's still challenging no matter how many cases you've done. But that initial challenge, I think, is something that I looked at and said, just like a game of golf, you know, as many times as you play, you might be good, but you're always going to mess up or have days where you're not as good as you think you are. And that's really what PAE does. So that, that, that definitely attracted to me as the challenge. Got it. Can you tell us, like, before we kind of dive into Prostate Centers USA, the, the current venture, did you have any kind of other ventures along the way that maybe didn't go as well that kind of brought you to this point? Yeah, I would say, you know, with respect to PAE, the, the really my, I would say my first and most significant, you know, or the two together, I would say challenge and failure was really related to PAE. And the core of that really was centered around that first U.S. clinical trial we did and started, you know, really started everything in 2009 and 2010 was to, you know, get our study up and running in an environment which was private practice, of course, but in a large institution which has a lot of infrastructure to perform clinical trials and, and has its own institutional you know, research committees, et cetera, not just IRBs, but you know, uh, endowments and foundations that support research. You know, when we first started that clinical trial, one of the mistakes that I made along with my team, but you know, it obviously falls on me, is in actually enacting and, and getting that clinical trial off the ground. And it was actually at the phase of closing down the clinical trial was recognizing that there are certain regulatory parameters that we didn't follow or know about. And this is despite, you know, my all my efforts of going to IRB to see what we needed and getting an IRB stamp, going to our clinical research team and asking them and getting their stamp of approval, having weekly meetings and going through things on a day-by-day -day basis with our team and saying checklists upon checklists, signing consents and making sure all the, the T's are crossed and the I's are dotted, we still missed one important feature of a clinical trial. And that was with respect to an FDA regulation in and around investigational device exemptions or IDEs. And even though we had already approached the FDA and approached our I IRB, some of the regulations had changed in and around the time that we were doing the clinical trial. And lo and behold, one day, as we're in the last weeks of closing down the trial, I get a knock on our front door at our office at our hospital, and it's somebody from the FDA and says, hey, we're here to inspect your research facility. And there's probably nothing more humbling than someone showing up to your office with a, with a black hat and three letters on it. You know, most of those three letters are never good. And... You know, we went through the process and um, it was, you know, I'd say three weeks where they sat every day, you know, comb through every piece of paperwork that you've ever signed, filled out, everyone on your research team, every nurse, every patient has signed off on, every tech has entered the floral times on, you name it, every single piece of paper. And you can imagine if you had to go through this kind of audit or inspection yeah. in your regular clinical practice, when you do it in a clinical trial setting, you know, it's even more, I would say, onerous. But suffice it to say, after going through this inspection for three weeks and then having to generate a response to the FDA, you know, which was probably, I don't know, some, you know, remembering back now, then probably about 40 to 60 pages long, come up with all sorts of new policies and procedures, present these, you know, if you will, deficiencies to your colleagues, to the hospital administration, to the IRB accept responsibility for all of them, even though it really falls on one core concept, which is, you know, no matter how many times we checked and checked and checked, you know, you almost have to take every little, I would say, check mark and do it yourself. You have to make sure you have the right team around you um, and make sure you double or triple check things. Despite all that, and that's what we've learned, of course, but it took about that 40 to 60 page response and about 18 months for us to get an acceptance letter from the FDA that it was okay. And 
when you're doing clinical research and you're first, you know, coming out of your training and you're like, man, I did clinical research when I was a medical student. I did it as a resident. I did it as an intern, you know, all this stuff, right? Yeah. When you come out and you do it on your own and you're the principal investigator and the sponsor of a study and, you know, it's a retrospective study, nobody cares. But when it's a prospective study, I wouldn't say nobody cares, but the, the, the benchmark is much lower in terms of responsibility. But yeah. when you're in a prospective clinical study and when you're dealing with investigational devices, of course, and you, you learn a lot about off-label marketing, et cetera, in a highly competitive device-driven industry, which interventional radiology is, then it teaches you a big lesson. And it can be a big setback. I would say that having gone through that experience, especially with something that I was so passionate about, and at the time, no one was doing in the U.S., it was something that, you know, you deal with embarrassment and you deal with like be feeling ashamed and you feel like, you know, you're failing your group, your partners, the hospital, you feel like you're failing the clinical research program, et cetera. But it took, you know, a good, I would say six to 12 months to sort of get everything in order and then finally make the decision of, is this something that I want to get involved in again? And yeah, that was my first, I would say, major setback, you know, with respect to, I would say both career and research and, you know, having your own initiative and being reminded that no matter how strong your initiative is, you know, and even if you think you're doing something with the, all the processes and you have a supportive team, um, you still have to question everything, even if you work within a, in a great team, which we did. And then frankly, I do believe, you know, we had a very good team. Just it's, you know, even great teams are capable of oversight. And, and that's exactly what happened. Yeah, it's kind of a reminder that, you know, anything worth doing is going to be challenging and have, you know, setbacks. And um, and so, yeah, that sounds like a great lesson, like, you know, knowing that there's going to be hurdles for for everything going forward uh, when, you, when you're trying to push push something forward like that. Was there anybody that served as a mentor to you that where because it sounds very stressful. So I imagine like for <laughs> me, I'd be like reaching out to people left and right on the phone. Yeah. But is there, were there key people in your life at that time that helped you out, get through it? Yeah, there, there were actually. So, you know, I would say I reached out to everybody. Um, and <laughs> yeah. of course, it's a hard story to tell, right? Every time yeah. you reach out to somebody in the evening and, you know, you get home from work and you're like, hey, so uh, the <laughs> FDA came to my door, you know, it's, and, it, and it, it, it's something now that, you know, we, I've learned a lot from those people and this experience. That, you know, that was part of, that was part of the growth experience is actually sharing the story so many times. Yeah. In fact, at a guest meeting many years ago, I was invited to give a lecture on what it's like to go through an FDA inspection. And that, it's also a humbling experience. But nonetheless, um, you know, I did, I reached out to, you know, I would say probably, you know, my most significant mentor who, you know, really had probably the biggest influence in, in me with respect to interventional radiology, which is Gary Siskin in Albany. And I reached out to him about it. And I reached out to a person in regulatory affairs at a major medical device company who I'd worked with in terms of consulting. And she was an excellent resource and could really, actually, she helped me on a day-by-day -day basis, really help me go through and figure out what are the best ways to respond to the FDA? And how do you respond? Do you just sort of, you know, do you take all your mistakes and throw a bunch of papers in the air and say, yeah, I really messed up everything? The whole process stinks? Or do you really go through your process and closely figure out, okay, you know, nine out of 10 things work and I really have to hone in on the one that doesn't work. Yeah. And I think that's what they both really helped me come to terms with is, you know, figuring out where you're at fault, figuring out where you need to improve and then figuring out if you can make those improvements at all, if you're even capable of making them. And then decide to move forward. And, and one of the biggest things I learned is I was in such a busy private practice environment that despite having the resources for clinical research, not having, I would say, you know, multiple other partners of mine or colleagues that were also similarly responsible for the project. And I would say sharing the responsibility amongst multiple right. people. What happens is it falls on your shoulder, you get busy in clinical practice, you get busy with your family, and even if you're working like I used to work from 5 a.m. to 10 p.m., it doesn't matter. You know, you could spend hours and hours on a project, but if your bandwidth is not there and you're really performing well beyond your bandwidth, then 
you're going to make mistakes and it can be small or large. And so the first thing I had to realize is very simple things. You know, you got, you know, even though we had weekly research meetings, for example, you know, you can't rush these meetings, right? You got to have them as a designated time. You got to have, you can't miss them. You know, if staff, if other staff members who might miss them because they're out vacation, et cetera, they have to be done anyway. So it became a, how do you prioritize time? How do you right. prioritize your interest? How do you prioritize responsibilities? And these are what these mentors really, I would say, help me understand and appreciate. But they also, like Suzanne, for example, who's who's the, the woman I mentioned who really helped me from a regulatory standpoint, understand that the rules that impl- that are in place are actually very, I would say, simple and easy to follow, which I also didn't have a very good understanding of because as most people who go through training, no one sits you down and goes through, you know, okay, guys, these are the FDA rules and regs for running yeah. a clinical research program. These are the basics of IRB, even if you've done your IRB training, et cetera, you know, more of a practical approach and having somebody like that who could be a mentor made me realize that, listen, you may get knocked off the horse, but you got to get back on and do it the right way. And I think that's what good mentorship does. Yeah. So have you been able to take um, the things that you learned from that experience and help others, you know, trying to put similar studies together? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, it's interesting. So after that study, since that study, I would say, where we didn't have an IDE, but then later on was were submitting for one, you know, subsequent to that study, I think I was involved in the next, you know, the next seven years, I probably was involved in another another nine IDE studies. Wow. And and, you know, they've ranged from shoulder to drug elution to pharmaceutical to, you know, beads for, you know, everything from PAE and, you know, knee embolization, you name it, all kinds of stuff. And what I realized is, um, you know, take this information, one, share this experience with your other research personnel, you know, teach them the lessons that, that you, where you made mistakes. So don't be afraid to share that failure, which is I had to do every single time I started or was involved in a new clinical trial. I would share this story and I would share our mistakes and I would share what we did to improve it. And I would say, look at what we've learned from this. And what I realized is, man, we know so much more now, or I know so much more now because I made that mistake. Of course, I wish I never did, but the amount I now know because of how deep I had to get into these regulatory affairs really helped me in so many ways that, you know, I'll give you an example in working with Ari, you know, for example, who had an investigational device exemption down at UNC for his prostate study. As we started to pivot together and bring in other researchers to work with us, what happened was we brought in these other physicians, medical students, residents alike, and research personnel. They they got to learn from both of us then, right? And then we built yeah. a team larger and worked on other studies. And so we've done that where we brought in other folks. And then we've, you know, we've taken this to more of a formulated approach. You know, in the SIR meeting, myself, Ari, and others on our team have, have given lectures on how to set up a research program. You know, what are the things to look for both in private practice or academics? And you know, people reach out, I would say, and whether it's a weekly, sometimes it feels like daily, but monthly basis to say, hey, how do I set up a knee study? How do I set up a prostate study? And right. what do I need? And what shouldn't I do and do? And I feel those questions all the time. And I, and I love answering them because I don't want people to make those same mistakes. And frankly, it's not even just about making the mistakes. They might even do the whole process altogether better. And that would be great. Yeah. That's, I mean, I imagine you get, you and Ari have become an incredible resource for anybody you know, diving into the embolization space. So, well, let's talk about Prostate Centers USA. Tell me, you know, it's a big idea. And I want to, I'm curious to know, like when you started pitching it to people, what was the response you get? Yeah. Tell us the, tell us yeah. the vision. Yeah. And then tell us like what kind of response you got when you started pitching it to people. Yeah. So, uh, you know, the vision really came from this, I would say dec- decade long time of spending hours upon hours, you know, working on research, working on position statements, publications, giving lectures, going meeting to meeting, flying all over the world, teaching people, proctoring people, people coming into the office, learning how to do PAE, you know, you name it. I mean, it was like, I felt like a whirlwind, you know, for 10 years of basically saying, how can I wave the flag anymore about PAE? And Honestly, Aaron, it felt like my arms were getting tired. And yeah. 
I have a friend and a colleague, you know, here in Northern Virginia named Pratik Desai. And Pratik is a urologist and he runs a very successful urology practice here in Northern Virginia. And two of his senior partners were involved in our very initial clinical trial and back 10 years ago. And they were supportive. They were supportive about doing preoperative testing, postoperative testing, referring to the clinical trial, et cetera. So over the last decade, his group has sent numerous patients for me to treat in a somewhat collaborative manner. Truthfully, they would send us patients and send me patients that they didn't want to take to the operating room. And his partners would send me cases that were fairly difficult or failures. And I would, of course, return the favor and send patients back when they needed surgery or whatnot or urologic workup. But over the last, I would say, you know, months to a year, year and a half approaching starting prostate centers, which we started in early 2020, was that I was having a few, you know, dinners, getting out for drinks and, and meeting with Pratik. And we'd always sit down and, and talk about, you know, we'd always sort of talk about IR and where it really fits in and all the medical specialties. And it's really mm -hmm. humbling when you sit down at a dinner table with a surgeon, you know, it's always like, you know, they have no problem giving you an opinion and they have no problem telling you, you know, where you're failing as a specialty. And I think I are probably, if we, if we hear this, as you know so well from, from many people, right? You yeah. hear the, you're not clinical. You hear the, you know, you guys don't take care of the patient, you know, over the long haul. You hear the, you know, who's rounding on the floor, coming in at two in the morning to put a super pubic. I mean, you hear it all, right? We've all heard. But you know, what Pratik came to me about, which is something that I found really, really startling and really, if nothing less, ego crushing and reset. And what he said to me was, he said, Sonny, you know, one thing I've learned about you, he said, in 10 years of watching you build PAE, treat people from all over the world, publications, I don't really, he's like, I don't really care. He's like, you have done so much and learned so much about BPH that he said, I think you probably know more about BPH and all the different treatments and the algorithms than my partners may, than other people may who are urologists, because you dedicated your career and the majority of, of, it, of it, not just to novel embolization, but really to, to BPH and to prostate health and prostate disease. So he said, so you've moved the needle. You know, you've right. moved the needle for IR. People in the IR community know you. You give talks, everyone says, oh, Sonny's talking, so it must be on PAE and all this stuff. And he said, if you really want to change the way, you know, your field is with respect to PAE, you may have already done that. And guys like Ari may have already done that and, and other folks who've really contributed in this, in this uh, arena have. But he pointed out to me very bluntly, he said, Sonny, if you want to change the way BPH is treated, and not just PAE for IRs, you need to work with urologists and you need to get them to believe in this procedure. And you need them to believe that the disease of BPH has to be treated just like cancer. And so when he said that to me, I was like, man, after all these years, Aaron, like, you know, you dedicate your life, you do all this stuff, you're spending all this time away from your family, et cetera. And he's like, you're really not going to move the needle. And it made me take a step back. And when I thought about it, I thought, you know, how do I, you know, one person go and, and pitch this idea of, I want to collaborate with urologists and bring PAE to them such that they can see a benefit. We can see a benefit from an interventional radiology community, but ultimately the disease process and the patient can see the benefit. And I think that was really the inspiration is really having a, 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 I'd say a mentor, a colleague, friend who's, who's in your, if you will, competing specialty, give you an honest opinion about, hey, you got to build something collaborative. And from that, we decided that we got to build these prostate centers. And so we started with a pilot and you know, nothing like, nothing like a first clinical trial and nothing like a pilot prostate center. <laughs> <laughs> That's where we went. So who did you team up with? Did you just, did you and your urology your buddy? go in on this together or did you build a, you know, a group of docs to go yeah. like, how did you, and how did you, uh, address it like in terms of staffing and then also like yeah. fund it? Absolutely. So, you know, in order to do this and regulations and laws are related obviously to Stark, which are probably well beyond right. maybe this podcast, but 
the reality is myself and Pratik and one other individual, Tiffany Ramos, decided to start this together. She um, has actually had experience as a scrub tech, but she's, you know, has a background in nuclear medicine and radio pharmaceuticals. And so the three of us sat down and said, let's come up with this company idea where we bring interventional radiology into urology groups or practices or standalone and uh, work closely uh, with urology practices to see patients and make sure that they're all treated under the same algorithm. And, you know, yes, so we had to come up with funding. We had to have a pilot practice that we work with. And Pratik, interestingly, is a cancer guy. So he's not even really treating much BPH anymore over the course of his career. Um, but he did, and I went with him to pitch to his group and say, hey, guys, let's bring to your group an interventional radiologist. We happen to conveniently have one on hand, and we'll bring him to your group and figure out if we can build out a prostate center. So then the ball started rolling with site plans, architect, redesign, you know, credentialing with insurance companies, malpractice. I mean, just the list goes on and on, infrastructure, yeah. staff hiring, and we leverage that off of each other. I mean, really, this was sort of a bootstrap kind of environment. Um, you know, I remember in the first, I would say it took about, it's a pretty rapid timeline, so I'm afraid to say how rapid it was, but in just a matter of maybe six to eight weeks, we pulled together a center and I got myself an office in WeWork, you know, and, uh, you know, went to work there every day and, and plugged away on the phone, computer relationships, use connections to sort of get things moving. You yeah. know, we, we, myself in particular, relied heavily on Tiffany to keep us organized in terms of our list of tasks that need to get done, which is really the hardest part, I would say, about getting any project off the ground is yeah. keeping your tasks really in order. And then yeah. from there, made it happen. Yeah. Did you guys use like a task organizer or software or something like that? Yeah, it's great. So, um, yeah, we're very, I would say, you know, note task oriented. So there's a yeah. series of them. I've probably burned through a few like most people. Right, you know, right. We, we, we probably used everything from the notes section of your iPhone where you share a checklist yeah. to more uh, complicated things like Gantt type spreadsheets where you can actually track tasks over a calendar. And more recently, we actually use very, a very simple task manager called Todoist or Todoist. Okay. And so Todoist is a, uh, like a simple app, but it's a, an app platform that allows you to integrate with your calendar and actually GAN softwares as well, but it allows you to assign tasks to different individuals, take responsibilities, deadlines, times, et cetera, and track them. So those are important. That That's super important, Aaron. Yeah. Well, it's, I, I ask because, you know, I've also, we've also burned through a few of them. I half of them don't even remember their names anymore, yeah. but yeah. there's so many out there and all you can do is try them, but it's hard because you don't want to, you don't want to invest too much time and energy if it's, you kind of want to, test it first yeah you know I, with with a few people absolutely i will tell you in the beginning there were two legal pads i still got them yeah, so yeah. i used to carry around a legal pad tiffany's carry on this legal pad and every page you know you'd start out with something on one page like a staffing plan and then everything on that page would be about staffing matrices salaries benefits you name it 401k and then all of a sudden it would start rolling over to the next page and then we had inventory lists and it yeah, just goes on yeah. and on and, and you know this routine it's it never takes ending. a lot of due diligence and it never ends. Yeah. Yeah. And discipline. Yeah. Um, for to keep on top of it. Well, anyway, we digressed about the task managers, but uh something that's definitely important. And so just for our audience, I wanted, you know, you you kind of gave us your grand vision and you had obviously some some cheerleaders in your corner, some people helping you out. Was there anybody that you pitched this to that just kind of shot it down? It was like, that's never gonna work. And you obviously <laughs> won't name names. Yeah. But that, those are challenges, right? Because that's there's you're gonna have an emotional response to yeah. somebody saying that. So th I think that's part of the founder experience is just getting kind of shot down sometimes. Oh yeah. So I, I can tell you. I mean, I pitched this to a CEO of a major. A, I mean, it, he's a friend, by the way. So I'll start by saying that. So yeah. I call him a friend, and he's the CEO of a major national platform for a niche interventional radiology service in America. And it's not in PAE like this, but it's in other, I would say, vascular type procedures. And yeah. when I went to him and said, what do you think of this idea? You know, it's really built on the concept of better care, collaborative care, and algorithmic care. And 
he looked at me and he's like, Sonny, why don't you just go straight to the patient? Why are you worried about, you know, working and collaborating with another specialty? You know, you can do your own marketing. You can do your own, you know, pay-per-click. You can, you know, when I sort of to bring this sort of full circle of what I learned and I think we talked about earlier with what it's like to be in that OBL environment is I already came from that environment yeah. of, you know, tomorrow is Groundhog Day. And right. so I needed to get out of that cycle. And it was a little heartbreaking, honestly, to hear this from a, a guy who's got dozens and dozens and dozens of successful centers gave you this opinion that, you know, I don't think this is the way to go. And I don't think it's going to be that successful. And I, and I, I took it to some other people. And listen, Aaron, when you have a lot of crazy ideas like I do, you know, <laughs> hey, let's start knee embolization of the U.S. Hey, let's start shoulder. Let's do this. You know what? A lot of people, you know, sometimes they hear you and they go, hey, it's just Sonny's got another idea. But I think, you know, having found somebody who is inherently going to be a doubter, like a urologist in this space and having them believe in it, that really is what, you know, provided that, you know, that pat on the back to say, just push forward. Don't worry about it. We'll figure it out. Stick yeah. to your vision. Make something work, and 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 then we'll we'll adjust accordingly to make it better and better as we go on, and 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 that's what we've done. Yeah, and and so you know, fast forward probably what a year or two now since you started the first that first pilot center. Yeah, How so long? it's been uh, it's eighteen months this week. Eighteen months. Yeah, and I know um, you know <laughs> you're opening some other centers. Yeah, and I wanted to ask, okay, how you know. How far along, like how many centers are, are you guys, where are you guys at today? And also I want to ask you about like ownership and because we, I just had Mary Constantino and Goke Akawande on recently and we were talking about ownership and how important that is when you have your own practice and Mary was big on real estate ownership. And so I was curious to know, is this something that you guys are incorporating in, in the centers, yeah, like are absolutely. trying to own your centers? Yeah. So it's been a very rapid 18 months. So much of my team. I would say despises me on a daily basis when I pick up the phone to call him or see him. Like, hey, we're going to be working on this next because we're we're at five centers uh, in the last eighteen months. So um, wow. we're moving pretty quick, and we yeah. have uh, a center coming up online in in uh, I'd say win late winter, early spring in Baltimore, and we're specking out some places right now in Michigan as our next two. I would say big moves, and one uh in ohio so okay we're moving pretty quickly we hope to have i would say 10 centers before the end of end of next year so wow. you know we also are looking at diversification beyond you know the general urinary space but yeah um yeah so that's where we're going and it's a very rapid growth and um you know i'd tell you that the people who work with us including ari right who's joined us as well um rachel pachowiak who joined us for one of the centers upcoming here in virginia the thing about these practices is the job's nice. The physicians love working collaboratively alongside their partners now who are other specialists because even though they share revenue, and this is where it's sort of dovetail into ownership and revenue is, is that it's definitely more secure. You know, you don't have to have that day-to-day -day worry again about getting support from the community when it's your right. community, you know. As far as real estate ownership, how companies work, I mean, Every company, right, has their own structure and, and we're probably no different standard, you know, company structure with shareholdership, et cetera. Um, we have a real estate arm of our company. And I think, you know, like Mary brought that up, that's, that's important too. I look at it as sort of icing on top of a company, if you will, because yeah. um, if you want to separate your real estate interests from your primary, I would say, practice, day-to-day -day practice interests, of revenue that's coming in the door, then it allows you to maybe have some advantages when it comes to real estate ownership. But the primary, I would say, aspect, you know, like you mentioned, sort of this ownership, am I a partner, things like that. These are really important concepts and they're really important uh, for physicians to understand in both our company and in every company. I mean, I remember, listen, I was a shareholder in a, in a, in a radiology practice and when I left, I got a stock certificate, which was exactly the same price that I paid when I bought the stock certificate. <laughs> and so the reality is, you know, does it really mean anything? You know, I don't know. I mean, in those situations, in yeah. our world, 
our company is like a publicly traded company. It acts just like that. It acts like a business where your shares have value. They go through an annual valuation. If you leave at X point in time, we have to buy your shares out or vice versa. There's obviously parameters to share vesting, et cetera, and things like that. But it's a it's a proper legal structure for owning shares in a business. Yeah. Many radiologists who come out, and this is what I've seen in interviewing a lot of new, I'd say, grads or trainees, is that there's this concept of, okay, I work at a certain place. You probably heard this too, I'm sure. I work at a certain place for four or five years or two years, and then I'm a partner, and, and then I'm right. a shareholder. But what does that actually mean, right? I mean, you hold phantom shares. Do you really just get profit sharing? Do you really own, you know, what percentage of shares do you own in the magnet that the senior partners own? I mean, it goes on and on and on. Mary probably has a more similar uh, aspect to her company like we do, you know, in the sense that it's an independent OBL, for example, take one OBL or two. There's a person who started it, they invested the money, and then somebody comes along and they can choose to buy in and then share in the profits of that, or they can invest into that. That is something that's very different because it's a tangible item, right? Yeah. Um, and I think you've probably seen this in radiology groups as well that you know, and, and um, but it is important. Real estate it is important if, if you're in an OBL space and you're entrepreneurial to understand the value of real estate. Um, it's, it's going through the roof everywhere. So right. it may be yeah. challenging when you're early on and starting an OBL to get involved in purchasing real estate. But we tended to lease, 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 long-term leases, and then started to make purchases as, as capital became available. Right, yeah. right. Yeah, I mean, um, we actually had John Lippman on the show last weekend to talk about kind of a similar, you know, his origin story of, you know, because he was doing this back before most people were even yeah. talking about OBLs. And again, kind of rolled the dice, bought, you know, unit to put in a, an OBL space. And he talked a lot about how important it is to focus on what you're most passionate about. And because there's some OBL owners out there um, who want to do everything that they can do in the hospital safely in the outpatient setting. Basically, yeah. it's like a shotgun approach, like yeah. whatever I can bring in, you know? And it seems like, I don't know if it's like a, you know, and I guess everybody's different. I mean, it, it's nice to have something that you're really passionate about and focused on enough that you want to do that day in, day out, every day. And, and you know, like you said, that that leads to better patient care. Because yes, absolutely. it's all about experience and more reps. And the more you do it, the better you're going to be at, be, be at it. And you're not like a, you know, jack of all trades, master of none, right? Absolutely. So, so I wanted to ask you about that. Like, you know, are, do you think that that is going to be part of, you know, and you talked about adding other things that are on the horizon, shoulder embolization, knee embolization. But again, those things being like focused on embolization therapies, is that sort of part of your vision going forward? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, much of the focus, obviously, in our centers is, you know, men's health so or urology space. And it may be you know, all the things that are involved from super pubic tubes, nephrostomies, AML embolization, pre-op embolization, you name it, PAE. So there's so many things, varicoceles, we get pelvic congestion, all right. core to a urology practice. But interestingly, in all of our centers, and including mine in particular, where I work primarily, we get a heavy amount of referrals for the things that if they like your service, you're going to see a lot of, as you know, PVD, venous work. I mean, chest ports, biopsies. So you see everything anyways. Yeah. But the ability, which again, uh, you know, when you're in a hospital-based practice or a very varied practice where let's say you share coverage of a hospital with multiple different IR partners, you're going to see different things, right? That pop up on the schedule and IRs are very capable of doing it. But like you said, having a niche focus and in ours, it probably primarily focuses on embolization. The one core aspect to this is when you get physicians who are very comfortable with advanced embolization, and by that I mean challenging anatomy, working through wires algorithmically, really tracking their outcomes to making sure they're having great outcomes. Those are the perfect physicians to be expanding their capabilities into knee embolization, shoulder yeah. embolization, and what might be you know some others that are on the horizon like thyroid, et cetera. And because now you're taking docs who have already made you know, this harder procedure, you know, a focus of theirs and become a passion of theirs to become very good at that. Yeah. It's going to be even easier for them to jump into these other spaces because they're disease oriented, right? They're really focused around different diseases, but the core of it is really, how do I understand complex embolization? And I think they definitely, there are things that already go on in our centers, but we certainly want to 
focus on the fact that we're now training, you know, sustaining and having these physicians who are so good at what they do. Let's give them the procedures and reward them with the procedures that they want to do and that they're good at. Right. And, and there's right. nothing better than that. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, I think a lot of people are really excited about genicular artery embolization, you know, shoulder embolization. Uh, those sound like incredible. I mean, you know, you look at all the, I mean, we read the x-rays, you know, you see yeah. all that, that degenerative uh, disease out there that could be treated. And so I, I think that that's going to be really exciting for people if, if, if that's, an, and uh, clearly it can be done safely in the outpatient setting too, yeah. which is nice. Absolutely. You know? Yeah. And I'm lucky. I mean, I got the other two docs who've done the clinical trials in the U.S. with me on it. And and they're right. great because there's there's so many nuances that we we've, we've learned over the last it's been six years we've been studying it and so yeah and, and you know even though it's like you know if you will hitting the runway you know for people to sort of say I want to take off and do this even in our own community we see people getting involved in it in the different places cities that we are and the outcomes aren't really great and the reason right. we're seeing is because a lot of those nuances were never really learned yet and the same thing the same learning lessons that we did with PAE are going to have to happen all over again with these newer procedures. Yeah. And so for the new guys coming out who hear this, like, you know, they're, they're looking for jobs. Yeah. Are, <laughs> are you okay with somebody taking street out of training or do you want them to get a few years? Like we we're talking to Tim Yates about this. It's yeah. nice to have people to have a few years of in hospital IR under their belt um, before they go into like an OBL setting. What's yeah. your stance on all that? I think, you know, it really varies. Okay, so one is it's it's totally individual. So I, I would hate to say that, yeah, you know, oh, because we don't want an old bird because you can't, you know, an old dog because you can't teach him new tricks. And we don't want, you know, a new one because you're never going to teach him to fly. You know, I think it's like a, it's it's difficult. It's very individual because yeah. each person, some come out with a really deep understanding and a good global understanding of patient care. The, the folks that come out of training that really have a good understanding of clinical care, and I mean like, you know, they know hypertensive meds. They know how to manage anticoagulants. They know how to right. start and stop meds. I mean, this sounds crazy, right? They know how to call case managers and be like, I need this person to go to sniff, right? Right. <laughs> the, those clinical aspects of, of, of medicine, that's what makes you really good in an OBL. Sure, getting bailed out of a difficult groin or, you know, access or complications, Absolutely. I mean, I think no matter what, the more experience you have when you go to an OBL, it'll always be better from a just a, a technical aspect. Right. The advantage we have is that when they come to one of our centers, they go through, if you will, even if they're new out of training or if they've had experience like a mini fellowship. So in one month, for example, somebody might come in and do 50 embolizations. So if they're wow. doing 50 embolizations, you know, let's say 30 prostates, some hemorrhoids, some knees, whatever, right? And, you know, PAD cases, all of a sudden after a month or two, you know, they're going to get very quickly up to speed because it's like what I say about training is you can get really good at something if you concentrate the volume in a yeah. short period of time. But if you do 60 PAE cases over a course of eight to 10 years, you're not going to be really good at it. And right. you're, not going to, you're not going to remember the patients who came back with complications. You're not going to remember, you know, the technical aspects, the anatomy very well because it was spread out over so long. So truthfully, Aaron, I mean, I, I loved taking on, you know, I would say a new grad, which we did. And then we're taking on some people who are two years out, um, which is a nice sweet spot too, because they've also learned what they don't like and what was not good. And they have some perspective of, okay, they took a job and I thought this was going to be clinical. It's not. I thought I was going right. to do all these great procedures at a big university, but I'm not. Right. And now they come out and they're like, wait a second, let me go visit this place. And they, you know, one of our, one of our I'd say negatives is people might think, oh, I'm only going to do PAE, but they don't realize that they're going to come here and they're going to do everything. And yeah. um, it's nice. So, I, so to answer, the answer to the question is that, you know, we'd really take anybody and because, and we'd really have good oversight and training. I mean, we even keep, just to give you an idea, we have a centralized monitoring system of all of our labs. So at any time, I mean, if Ari needs help with a case or I do, I can dial him up. He can look right at my, wow. you know, look right at my floral screen and be like, Sonny, hey, Got a second opinion. This is what I'll tell you to do here. Or, you know, how would I treat this collateral? So whoever comes to work with us, they're always going to have that oversight all the time. Um, yeah. and I think that also helps, right? With new with new folks as well. So they get That's their independence, cool. but they get to learn also from afar and 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 feel, you know, confidence too, which is important. Yeah. That sounds really cool. Yeah. 
So you spoke at the last OEIS. Anything that you, and we're going to wrap up because we're at about the sure. hour, Sonny. Anything you saw at the meeting that you're excited about? Any, um, we already kind of talked about the the trainees, but anything that um, you're really excited about that you saw at, at the last OEIS? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say, you know, for me, uh, every time, as you know, you go to that meeting, it's so inspiring because you meet a lot of entrepreneurial types. Yeah. Um, you know, to me, I, I saw a lot more in terms of, I'd say, collaborative discussion um, when it came to across specialties, uh, surgery, et cetera, you know, surgery, uh, cardiology, and interventional radiology. I thought that was better to hear than a bunch of people come to a meeting and like, okay, I'm going to go, I'm going to go start my OBL and you go start your OBL. They seem to be right. a lot of collaborative discussions um, in and around the meeting. And I would say, um, you know, the growth of support from industry around OBLs. That was really exciting to see. You know, in, in years past meetings, you know, you get the, the folks who come, who are going to come, right? Who are going to sell devices, right? Yeah. You know, the devices are commonly used. But you don't often get the, and you haven't as much in the past as you're getting now, the revenue cycle management companies, right? The mm -hmm. HR type companies that can help support. Yeah. These are the actual difficult <laughs> aspects of running a lab. Right. And I think though seeing that support, whether it comes in software, uh, human support, who came in architecture, where people came and offered architectural plans, et cetera, that was exciting to see because for folks that are getting involved in this OBL space, which is challenging, and it, and there's certainly you know almost a thousand or whatever OBLs in America, right there, it is um, you need the help, and and it's yeah. good to see that they're getting that support. How about yourself? Did you did you see anything, Aaron, that in particular you liked at the meeting? Unfortunately, I wasn't able to be there in person, so I just yeah. caught virtual stuff. Yeah, I caught your lectures, which were great, and and, <laughs> yeah, and about lessons learned, too, which are always good. Right, right. You know, for me, like you said, it was just kind of, I liked the the diversity and the variety. You know what I actually really liked was Craig Walker's talk on uh, wearables. Oh, um, yeah. I, I don't know if you caught that, but I was like, God, I, did. I didn't realize how advanced it's gotten and what cool stuff's coming out. Um, cause I, I kind of, I, I like to buy like the latest, you know, yeah. gear and stuff, but it's pretty neat, you know, and, and it's cool that Craig is on top of that. You know, he clearly, he has a passion for like, what's the tech out there. And, now, and so that I really like that one. Wearable, wearable tech is definitely interesting. And I'm sure it's, it's, if any space it's going to invade, it's going to be in radiology radiology for sure. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, well, Sonny, um, when, a uh, I think it's a good way to end it. Uh, thank you so much for coming on once again. Um, we'll have to look back and count how many times it's we're probably getting close to, <laughs> a, you know, 10 to 12 times you've been on the show now. We, yeah, we, people, we always have, appreciate people have got to be sick of my voice. There's no doubt about it. <laughs> but it's a great voice. I, I, we're not sick of it. Brats and I are not sick of it. So we'll, well you guys you are on. doing a great job at back table. It's, it's amazing. I listen, I, I listen to every episode. I mean, even, <laughs> even like, even my father, Retired physician listens to your episode. Does so, he really? What, what's yeah, he, uh... not, even, not because his son is on him, but he does. He's a nephrologist. Oh, but, yeah. You know, when he's 80, he's 82 now. But, you know, it's interesting. He, he finds it interesting to hear all of these physicians, and in particular, younger physicians, right? Like, talk about yeah. challenges, successes, whether it's disease processes, techniques. You know, it's 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 a great platform, and you know this. I, I, I've loved it since you started. You guys have both started, and it's been great. Well, thank you, Sonny.